It's a delight to be in God's house with you all this morning. Uh, and uh, we are honored to have the kids in with us today. If you're a kid, would you raise your hand, please? Raise your hand if you're a kid. Thank you, Pastor Kyle. We know that. All right. Uh, and I see some adults raising their hand. All right. Um, if I could get a couple brave kids to come up here, I want to start this message by asking a couple survey questions. So a couple brave children, if you wouldn't mind coming on up here. All right, great. We have one brave child. All right. All right. Come on up. All right. Now, uh, all right, come on down. All right. We got like a whole bunch now coming forward. Okay. All right. We, no, no, Ron, you can go see seat down. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So I want to go ahead and you just tell, you, tell everyone your name. All right. Tell everyone your name and your age, okay? All right, great. We got a great group up here. All right, so this is a survey. Now today I'm going to talk to you about choices, choices, and so I'm going to give you guys some choices. I'm going to see how you make these choices, okay? And so let's say you've got in front of you some food on a table, okay? All right, and on the one hand you've got a pizza, and on the other hand you've got a bowl of lima beans, okay? Which do you eat? Pizza, that is the only correct choice. All right, on that. So, uh, all right, so uh, now, let's say you also have on table, you got some food choices before you, all right, and you've got Brussels sprouts, all right, and a bowl of chocolate ice cream. Ice cream, ice cream of course. All right, so, I mean, it's, you know, what other choice can you do? It's, all right, now, let's say... You got, you're sitting at a table, okay? There's food in front of you, and you got a choice between pancakes, all right, and biscuits and gravy. Pancakes. Pancakes, all right. That's a tougher one. That's a tough choice, all right? All right. It almost depends what mood you're in on that day, right? So, okay. All right. Now, with you, we're going to ask about drinks. Do you, like you like to drink liquids and stuff? All right. All right. Good. All right. So, all right, so you've got a glass, a glass of ice water, all right, a chocolate milkshake. Glass water. Oh, water, all right, all right, so, all right, very good, glass of water. Are you trying to get in good with your parents or something on that? All right, so, all right, so, um, so these are choices. Now, here's another preference choice here. You got a choice between going to school or having a snow day. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> all right. But three to one, three to one, snow day. All right. Thank you all very much. Let's give them a hand. Thank you very much. All right. All right. So. <laughs> All right, some great choices there. All right. Now, some choices uh, are pretty easy to make. Unfortunately, uh, not fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, choices really shape who we are and what our identity is. Uh, there's an Indian economist that said the identity of an individual is essentially a function of her choices rather than the discovery of an immutable attribute. So as we do our series on identity, and this month focusing on the choices that we make, let's understand that the choices we make are very important when it comes to our reputation, our identity, and who we are. And yet, there is a controversy that takes, that's taking place in our society right now over how much control do we really have on our choices. How much of our choices are really us, or how much of our choices are beyond our control? And let's agree that there are some choices that we don't have control over. I just asked these young men up here if they'd rather go to school or have a snow day. But unless they've got some secret connection to the Montgomery County Public Schools that I don't know about, they don't have control over whether it's a snow day or not. And there are many choices that, that, that we, have, we don't really have control over. There are many factors in our life that we don't have control over. You didn't choose who your parents are. You didn't choose when you'd be born. You didn't choose, uh, you know, the color of your hair or the color of your skin. You didn't choose uh, uh, what country you'd be born in. Uh, these, are, these are things that are beyond your control. 
And so how much uh, control do we really have over our lives? Now, this is a discussion that takes place amongst Christians and non-Christians. In fact, uh, the late and uh, brilliant Albert Einstein said, uh, it is, I, I do, he does not believe in human freedom. He says, I do not at all believe in human freedom in the philosophical sense. Everybody acts not only under external compulsion, but also in accordance with inner necessity. So Einstein is basically advocating a philosophy, a school of thought that's known as determinism. Now, determinism basically says that everything that you choose to do is predetermined either by circumstances or by internal programming. In other words, how your chemicals react and your neurological activity and things that take place inside your body over which you have little to no control, these things determine the choices that you make. So even when you sit down and you decide lima beans or pizza or, or water or milkshake, that it's neurological activity and chemicals and atomic activity taking place inside of you that determines that choice. And therefore, you can't say that you have free will. That is the school of thought known as determinism. And it is a leading theory amongst evolutionists and amongst uh, materialists and amongst uh, atheists and agnostics. In fact, uh, this gentleman here is, uh, is from Britain and he uh, has done a basic argument. Uh, he's a psychologist on the basic argument against moral responsibility. And he writes, number one, you do what you do in any given situation because of the way you are. Number two, in order to be ultimately responsible for what you do, you have to be ultimately responsible for the way you are, at least in certain crucial aspects. Number three, but you cannot be ultimately responsible for the way you are in any respect at all. Therefore, number four, you can't be ultimately responsible for what you do. So the philosophy of determinism basically removes all responsibility from each person and basically argues that, that we are just the way we are because of things that are beyond our control. And when the choices that we make are beyond our control, therefore there is no responsibility. Lest you believe that this is some kind of fringe or abstract theory, uh, one of the leading atheists in, in the world today is a guy named Sam Harris. And he has written a book that I'm reading now called Free Will. And his book, uh, basically, he makes the argument that, there, that free will is an illusion. And I quote here from his book, our wills are simply not of our own making. Thoughts and intentions emerge from background causes of which we are unaware and over which we exert no conscious control. We do not have the freedom we think we have. Now, some atheists and agnostics and materialists and secular scientists reject determinism in favor of philosophy known as compatibilism. And they argue that conscious choice and freedom is compatible with the idea that we are evolved. But Harris, in his book, Free Will, points out that if you follow atheism to its logical conclusion, then these atheists are trying to have it both ways. They're trying to claim that we live in a universe that has no meaning that's simply here by accident, but at the same time, we can exert some kind of free will or control. And Harris is at least intellectually honest enough to say, that can't be possible. If we are here, if we are here in this universe beyond our control, and if we're just here by accident, then the universe has no meaning, and therefore our choices have no meaning. That is the ultimate logical outcome of believing that there is no God, and believing that there is no such thing as a human soul. Now, over and against that, is the Christian worldview, which says that we do matter, that our choices matter, and that we must find our identity in God. And yet, even in Christian circles, there is a debate taking place on how much our choices really do matter. And that is what I want to focus on today. My message today is how much do our choices really matter? We see in the book of Proverbs, chapter 19 and verse 21, the Bible says, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Now, um, in order to get into this discussion, I'm going to have to cover a lot of territory today in my message. So I'm going to speak fast, and I'm going to go deep. 
And so I want to say to the kids that are here today, if I lose you, just please write down some questions, and I will be happy to meet with you and your parents later, and we can discuss this. All right? And to those adults, if I lose you, write down your questions, and I will be happy to talk to you about this later. And don't feel bad if I lose you, because these are some complicated issues that we're going to get into today. And, and, and I, I, I don't need to dumb it down, because everyone here is smart. We're all, we're, just, we're a smart people, okay? But the reality is that sometimes we don't spend a lot of time thinking about these things. Uh, but the Bible has a lot to say on this subject. And it's important for us to understand what God says about our choices and whether our choices matter and to what extent that they matter. Uh, and so that's what we're going to look at today. In order to get into this discussion, of course, I have to address the, the uh, centuries-long debate between free will versus predestination, or between Calvinism and Arminianism and all of that. Uh, and, and whenever I, I address this subject, or frankly, sometimes in whatever circles you're in as a Christian, you will often be asked, are, are you a Calvinist? And for a lot of churches, that's almost like a, a rite of passage. You know, it's like, if you're not a Calvinist, then you're a heretic, and get out of here. And a lot of churches, including a lot of Southern Baptist churches, are actually dividing over this doctrine, over Calvinism and predestination and everything. So I want to appeal to you from the Apostle Paul what he says on this question. Uh, and Paul writes, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this to each of, each of you that says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? See, in the early church, there were divisions coming up even then. And even in the Christian world, there were certain tribes and interest groups cropping up in the church. And they were following their own popular figures at the time. And so they were, some were following Paul and thought Paul was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And they were following him. And some were following Cephas, which is Peter. And so is Peter. And some were following Apollos. We don't hear a lot about Apollos, but he was a great orator in the early church. He was the guy that was mentored by Priscilla and Aquila. And Apollos was a great preacher, and people loved to hear his sermons. He was also a great debater, and he would debate a lot of the Jews and convert them, you know, and urge them to be converted to Christ, and the Holy Spirit would work and convert them. And so... Uh, Apollos uh, was very popular, and so Paul is addressing this fact, these divisions, and these Christians kind of lining up in these different camps. And what, what was happening back then is happening even today. I can tell you that in the Christian world, there's a lot of, a lot of Christians that gravitate toward, toward certain preachers and certain theologians. I remember having a discussion one time with an individual about this issue uh, of predestination and free will. And this issue was, uh, was saying, you need to read Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. Now, in case you don't know, Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, and I have read many excerpts from that. I have read a lot of that. In fact, right now I'm reading a treatise by John Calvin. Uh, and he's one of the greatest thinkers and theologians in church history, no question about that. But if, for those of you that have not read Calvin's Institutes, let me, let me tell you this. It is about 283,000 words long. It'll take the average reader 15 hours to read it straight through. 15 hours. Now we're getting up to biblical length there when you get to that. Now the King James Bible is about 780,000 words. All right, so it's, it's much longer. So Calvin's not quite at that level yet. But still, that's a lot. A lot to read through that. And yet, this person basically said that I needed to read Calvin even more than I needed to read the Bible. And there are people... That, uh, that will line up in these different camps and everything. And so I want to tell you right now, I am not preaching to you today as an Armenian or as a Calvinist or as a John MacArthurite or a John Piperite or an Al Molarite or any other person. I am preaching to you today as a preacher called by Jesus Christ. I am a follower of Christ. And in the same way that Paul appealed to the church in Corinth, I'm appealing to you. We should not divide over this. We should unite around Christ. And we are here to 
understand what Christ teaches by himself and through his apostles in the word of God. Now, if I say something today that doesn't strike you right or that you disagree with, then I encourage you to do as the Berean Christians did and search the scriptures to see that these things were so. Know that the Berean believers did not search Calvin's institutes to see that these things were so. And a lot of times we as Christians, we will rely more on books about the Bible than we rely on the Bible itself. Now, I love commentaries and I love theology books. I do. I enjoy reading all of that. But the thing that I enjoy reading the most is the Word of God. Because any commentary and any theological treatise written by another human being is just that. It's something written by a human being. All right? I want to go to the source. I want to hear what God has to say on this subject. And so today I'm going to preach to you from God's Word on this. Um, and so, so I hope that, that you will receive it in that manner. Now, when it comes to um, our identity and our choices, the Bible does have a lot to say on this subject. Uh, we read in Proverbs, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Uh, in uh, Proverbs 20 and verse 24, a man's steps are far from the Lord. How then can man understand his way? Uh, or from that far from, or from the Lord. Uh, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. That's from the prophet Jeremiah. Um, and then we have this interesting uh, exchange in the book of Exodus. If you remember the story, uh, Moses is uh, uh, being called by God to go to Pharaoh uh, and to appeal on behalf of the, of the children of Israel there in, Moses, in, in captivity in Egypt. And so God is telling Moses what to do and giving him instructions. And then we read this in Exodus. Uh, the Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now, if I'm Moses and I'm, I'm listening to God, now I'm going to be reverent, of course, and worshipful and all that. Absolutely. But at the same time, I'm having a conversation with God. I'm going to be like, can you rewind the tape a little bit there, God? What you, you, know, you want me to go and appeal to Pharaoh. You want me to go and show these miracles that you've given me to do and perform Pharaoh, and yet you are going to harden his heart. What's wrong with that picture? I mean, I mean, you want me to tell Pharaoh to let, let, let my people go, and yet at the same time you're going to harden his heart? That doesn't seem right. That seems confusing. It's like, what, 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 is, what is all this about? And this has created a lot of confusion. Over, 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 the, over the centuries on this. In Exodus 33, God also speaking to Moses. Here Moses is asking to see God's glory. And Moses is saying, you can't handle seeing all my glory. Uh, and in this course of this conversation, uh, this is what happens. The Lord, he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So God asserting his right here, God is asserting his right to have compassion on whoever he chooses to have compassion on. And mercy on whoever he chooses to have mercy on. Um, and then uh, we come to the writings of Paul in the book of Romans. Now this, these, this is a passage that is um, well-traveled in circles on this discussion and this debate. I'm going to read excerpts from Romans 8 and 9 and 10 to you right now, and then we'll elaborate on this and explain this a little bit. In Romans chapter 8, which is one of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible, but in Romans 8, right after right after Paul writes that uh, all things work together for good, to them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, right after that, Paul writes this in 29, for whom he, the Lord, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Just real quick, a few of the terms here. Four news referring to God's foreknowledge. We know that God is all-knowing. And when you think about God being all-knowing, that means God knows everything. That means God knows the past, the present, and the future. He knows everything. So based on God's foreknowledge, he predestines certain people to be conformed to the image of his son. And ultimately, that's what we as Christians are supposed to be. 
We're supposed to be conformed to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. We're not just supposed to claim the name of Christ. We're supposed to be Christ-like. And that is something that we are called to do by God. Moses, or Paul then goes on to say um, that, uh, that we, are, we are predestined. Predestined means predestiny. Predestined. And that God controls that destiny. These he also called justified means just as if I've never sinned. So justification, that's the salvation. And then glorified is referring to the sanctification. So we are justified and then we are set apart and sanctified to be, glorif to be glorifying to God. Uh, now, in Romans 9, Paul goes more deeply into, into this idea of God's choices and what God's will is. And so we read this. He starts off talking about Israel, and then he, then he moves it to a more broader perspective here. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh... These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Now, for this is the word of promise, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And by, and not only this, but when Rebekah also is conceived by one man, even by her father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. Uh, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. That's a verse that you'll hear a lot of in this debate. And it goes on, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. In other words, God used Pharaoh to show his glory, God's glory, to the whole world. Notice that Pharaoh was rebelling and hardening his heart against God, but God still used Pharaoh not in the way that Pharaoh wanted to be used. Therefore, he, God, has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. This is a heavy passage. It is a controversial passage. And it is one that theologians have debated for centuries. I, I recently watched an interview with a lady who was from the Westboro Baptist Church cult. Now, let's understand the Westboro Baptist Church is not a church. It's a cult. It's not Baptist by any stretch of the imagination. They don't hold to, to, to definite Baptist doctrines. You say, why do they call themselves Baptist? There's a lot of crazy people out there that call themselves Baptist, all right? But one thing that you will note about church history and church politics here and church structure is that if, if, if you and I got together right now, we could not go start a Catholic church. We could not go start a Presbyterian church. We could not go start a Methodist church. Those denominations are very controlled and very structured, very top-down. But we could go start a Baptist church. We can start that because Baptists are autonomous and so, and so that's why in the news, every time I hear some crazy church or crazy pastor saying something, I'm just, my head sinks because I'm like, I know they're probably a Baptist. You know, it's like, you know, because Baptists are, are notorious for that. They're independent. They're autonomous. We are part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, we voluntarily associate with the Southern Baptist Convention. 
But anyone in the SBC will tell you that within the SBC, there's a lot of variety of different churches in the SBC because we are autonomous. I don't get marching orders from the, from the Montgomery Baptist Association or the Baptist Convention of Maryland, Delaware, or the Southern Baptist Convention on what to preach. Our church can make decisions and do stuff without regard to that. We are autonomous. So that's why there's a lot of crazy Baptist churches out there, right? All right, but, so, but, so, but the Southern Baptist Convention has appropriately condemned and disavowed the Westboro Baptist Church. So Westboro Baptist Church is not a church. It's not Baptist, and the people of Westboro don't want anything to do with them either. So, uh, so it's hard to even designate them. But nevertheless, this one lady who used to be a part of that cult uh, finally escaped from that cult and recognized uh, how horrific uh, they were and how terrible they were. She escaped from that, but then she, instead of, instead of getting into a good Bible-believing church, she has renounced Christianity altogether and considers herself no longer a Christian. And in this interview, she was asked, or she said, the reason I'm not a Christian is because of this passage right here. She cited Romans 9 and basically said, it's not fair. It's not fair that God would create some vessels, people for his mercy, and create some vessels, people for destruction. And that we are not allowed to question that. And so because she sees that as unfair, she's walked away completely from the Christian church. Now I'm going to say to you this morning, she doesn't need to do that. Because if you have a deeper understanding of this passage, you'll understand what Paul is trying to say and what the heart of God is on this. Um, and as I explore this and as I get into this, I understand that some of you may have a lot of questions and some of you may disagree with me. Again, I encourage you to pray. I encourage you to search the scriptures. In no way am I saying I'm infallible on this, but I am saying I have studied this and prayed through this enough that I believe, I believe, as I'm standing up here, that I'm sharing with you as best I can in my feeble pea brain and my humanity. I believe I'm sharing with you as best I can the heart of God on this subject. And I hope that this will encourage you on this. God is responsible. So let's understand that. When we, when we, when we understand that God is the creator of the universe, he is ultimately responsible for everything that happens in his creation. And, uh, and that is really a lot of what Romans 9 is getting at. Uh, we know God is all-powerful. That means God can do anything that, uh, except what is contrary to his nature. But he can do anything that power can do. He's all-powerful. He has complete power. He has control over this universe and this galaxy. God is all-powerful. He even has control over my will and your will. He's all-powerful. We are, we are not able to thwart the ultimate providential will of God. He's all-powerful. God created the heavens and the earth and all of humanity. He's all-powerful, and he created everything that there is. This reality that we live in, God created it. We are playing and living in God's sandbox, literally. Uh, God is all-knowing. So understand these qualities, these attributes. God knows everything. God is all-powerful. God created everything and everyone. No one is an accident in God's eyes. And so God is all-knowing. He knows everything. He knows all of your thoughts right now. He knows who's paying attention to the sermon and who's not, okay? God, I have a pretty good idea as well, but God knows, okay? God knows. God knows everything. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow. He knows what you're going to do next year. He knows how long you're going to live. He knows whether you're going to wake up tomorrow. God is the one that's going to allow you to wake up tomorrow if you do. God is all-knowing, all-powerful. He is completely and totally in control. It is, a, it is important that we get that premise. If God is everywhere present. Psalm 139 makes this clear. You can't run away from God. You can try. As Ronald Reagan once said to the terrorist, you can run, but you can't hide. Well, what Reagan said to the terrorist is very true with God. You know, you can run from God, but you can't hide from God. There is nowhere you can go away from God's presence. God is everywhere present. Uh, and therefore, God makes choices. He makes choices based on his attributes. This is very important. He makes This is extremely important to get this. The choices that God makes are not based on some arbitrary, capricious attitude that some people assign to God. The choices that God makes are from God's own nature. God makes choices and wills things according to who he is. God's identity determines God's choices. God's nature and God's choices are synonymous. So his choices are based on his attributes, 
And within that, he is responsible ultimately for everything that happens within his creation and under his watch. And uh, now, tomorrow is a holiday that most of you know as President's Day. It is the most vapid, worthless, meaningless, absurd holiday of the year. Um, and, uh, and every time someone says President's Day, I cringe. You know, it's like, you know, it's like that's not, that is not the official legal name of the holiday. Uh, and we have turned something that once was meaningful into something that is just meaningless. You know, anyway, but I will play along and drink the Kool-Aid and use an illustration from one of our presidents to, to illustrate this point. Uh, this is Harry Truman. Harry Truman was the president of the United States uh, at the end of World War II and during the Korean War. And, and President Truman uh, was a big stickler. He's also a Christian and a Baptist, by the way. Uh, and Truman was a stickler on taking responsibility for one's actions. And he had a sign on his desk. And that sign is pictured here in this picture. And that sign says, uh, the buck stops here. All right, that was, He's very well known for that, very famous for that. And what Truman was saying is that, look, we talk about the federal government, whatever, whatever happens to the federal government, you know, you can point the finger and blame other people and everything, but ultimately the buck's got to stop somewhere, and that's at the desk of the President of the United States. So in terms of, in terms of the executive branch, anyway, the executive department of the, of the government, uh, he is ultimately responsible for what happens in the executive branch of government, the executive department. And he can't point the finger at anyone else. He can't blame anyone else. He is the president. Now, what is true for Truman is a hundred times true for God. God is the master of this universe. God created all of us. He created you. He created, he knows you intimately. He created the world in which you inhabit, in which you live. And therefore, all the choices that you make, whether, you know, God either orchestrates that or allows it. And even if you say, well, God just allowed it, God is still responsible for it. Because at any time, God can step in and stop you from making the choice that you make. God could have stopped Adam and Eve from making that choice in the garden. Think about it. He could have stopped them. He could have stopped them and said, wait, stop. Eve, don't listen to that serpent. He's a bad dude. Don't listen to him. He could have done that. But God didn't. God allowed Adam and Eve to eat that fruit. He allowed it. Not only did God allow Adam and Eve to eat that fruit, but God created the circumstances in which they did so. God created Adam the way Adam was. God created Eve the way Eve was. God created the serpent. God created Lucifer. God created the angels, including the third of the angels that fell and are now demons. God created everyone and everything. God created all of that. And God then delegates a degree of free will to his creation but at any time, he could step in and stop his creation from making bad choices. God allowed Adam and Eve to eat of that fruit. He allowed them to do that, knowing in his foreknowledge what that would mean. He allowed them to eat of that fruit, knowing that all of humanity would then be affected by that sin nature. He allowed Adam and Eve to eat that fruit, knowing that as Paul would write later, wherefore is by one man, Sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So the death passed upon all men for all of sin. Romans 5.12, God allowed that to happen. Not only did God allow it to happen, he orchestrated the very conditions in which it did happen. And therefore, it can be said logically that God is responsible. And that is what I believe Paul is getting at in Romans 9. God created the world. He created people knowing that some people would reject him. Knowing they would, he still created them. Knowing that some people would reject him, and therefore some people would go into a Christless eternity and pay the penalty for their sins, he knew it, and he did it anyway. And therefore, it can logically be said that he created some vessels for mercy and some vessels for destruction. If you read the story in Exodus, at the beginning, it said, God tells Moses, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. But later in the narrative, it says, Pharaoh hardens his heart. So the debate is, wait a minute, did Pharaoh harden his heart or did God harden Pharaoh's heart? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. You see, we accept a lot of dichotomies in the Christian world. We accept the Trinity, do we not? A 
hope you accept the Trinity. It's in the statement of faith. You better accept it. Okay? You know, so I uh, hope you accept the Trinity. We accept that God is three persons and yet one. We accept the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We accept that Christ is completely God and completely man. And therefore, we need to accept this dichotomy too. As Norman Geisler, a great theologian, says, we are chosen but free. We must accept the fact God is in control, and yet he delegates a degree of free will to us. Now, um, Sam Harris, in his book, Free Will, talks about the fact, he, he opens the book with an illustration that I will not go into right now because the kids are present here, but he opens it with a gruesome, terrible crime committed by two, two young men. And, uh, and he says that as, as, upset, as upsetting as the actions of these two, it is a terrible crime. As upsetting as this terrible crime was, Harris says, I can't say that I would have done anything different were I in their situation. He says, atom for atom, if atom, A-T-O-M, atom for atom, uh, molecular structure, atom for atom, if I had their same genetic and molecular makeup and their same circumstances, Sam Harris says, I would have done the same thing that they did. And he says, because there's nothing beyond that when it comes to any human being. But the Bible teaches there is something beyond our molecular makeup. And it, you can see that clearly in the book of Genesis. That's why I started in Genesis in the series on choices. In the book of Genesis, we are told that God created us, mankind, in his image. In the image of God created him. Male and female, he created them. You and I are imagers of God. We are created in the image of God. That elevates us beyond just basic molecular matter. We are not an accident of nature. We are made in the image of Almighty God. And the Lord says in Genesis 2, 7, or Moses writes, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. King James says a living soul. That is what separates us from the molecular compounds that atheist writer Sam Harris talks about. There's something different and unique about humanity. But for those of us that are wondering, what about, you know, this whole thing about predestination and everything? I understand I made the image of God. And I'd like to live with God for all eternity. But if my salvation doesn't depend on me, how can I know that I've been chosen? Uh, and uh, and uh, Peter uh, has a lot to say about this. He writes in his letter, his epistle, he addresses it to the elect. And this is, uh, this is directly, he says, To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, elect according to the foreknowledge of God and the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The elect. The elect is a term used throughout the scriptures, New Testament in particular, but also in the Old Testament to refer to God's chosen people, the elect. We are elected by God. Um, but how can I know if I'm in the elect? That's a pretty important question, right? I mean, if I'm going to be in the elect of God, if i, if I got a choice to make, I want to be in the elect of God. But yet, Paul in Romans 9 talks about how God's will supersedes our will, so how do we know? There's a sad story on this. There was a pastor... Actually, there was a group of three pastors many years ago, and they were um, uh, pastoring their churches faithfully and all that. And then they became obsessed with the, with the writings of John Calvin. They read and digested all of Calvin's institutes, and they, they went back and read Augustine. And they, become, they became obsessed intellectually with the doctrines of Calvinism and predestination. And uh, they felt that this was the, the, the coolest thing ever, and so they began to preach Calvin even more than Christ in their pulpits. And eventually the churches fired them. They lost their jobs. This one pastor in particular, though, I mean, he just doubled down. He just he, he, can, he continued to, uh, to, you know, really admire and if not worship John Calvin, continued to intellectually uh, dive into that. And then all of a sudden it hit him. Wait a minute. If I'm dead in my trespasses and sin, and as Calvin says, I'm totally depraved, and therefore I can do nothing, and therefore nothing I say, nothing I do matters, that even though I have professed Jesus Christ as my Savior, how can I know that I'm truly one of the elect? Maybe I'm just kidding myself. If, if the election is completely up to God, and I have nothing to do with it, as many hardcore and, and frankly extreme Calvinists maintain, then who's to say that my profession of faith means anything? And a lot of Christians actually go through this crisis. They're like, well, wait a minute. Am I really saved then? And this is a serious thing, and one thing I want to get across to you is if you're here today, God has not given you the spirit of fear. You don't need to fear this. And the Bible
Bible is explicit on this. First of all, God loves you. Absolutely loves you. Um, he who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. 1 John 4, 8. Uh, this is God's attribute. Think about this. God's very attribute, His very identity. God is love. And all the choices and decisions that God makes, remember, come from his nature and his attributes. Not from John Calvin, and I'm not bashing Calvin today, I'm not. But his attributes don't come from John Calvin, or John MacArthur, or John Piper, and these are preachers that I, that I admire, or R.C. Sproul, who went to heaven recently, or, or even the great Billy Graham, or whatever. God's attributes and choices are not determined by them. God's attributes are determined by God. And God is who God is. And God is love according to his word. He's love. And therefore we can rest. John who writes that also writes the, the gospel of John. For God so loved the world. It doesn't just specify the elect. It doesn't just specify the Christian world. It's God so loved the world. The world. Why? Because God is love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That Whoever believes, whosoever believes, should not perish, but has eternal life, everlasting life. Uh, and then Romans 5, it says this, Paul writes, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You can't compete with a love like that. God loves you. You are not an accident to God. And God loves you. And the resume that God has to prove his love is he sent Jesus to the cross to die for you. And so, you don't need to question God's love for you. In Romans 10, which is the very chapter after Romans 9, which is disturbing and controversial to a lot of people. But the, we're the ones that added the chapters and verses. In the very next chapter, Romans 10, Paul writes this. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. If you have called on the name of the Lord, done so sincerely, guess what? You're in the elect. You're an adopted child of God. You don't need to worry about Romans 9. Romans 9 is not telling you, hey, you never know. You may not be saved. God may have cho not chosen you. That is not the message of Romans 9. The message of Romans 9 is that God is in control. He's in control. He knows what people are going to do and what they're not going to do. He's responsible ultimately for their choices. You don't have a right to judge God because God knows a whole lot more than you do. It's above your pay grade to judge God. Don't try to judge God. Just get reconciled to God and call on his name. That's what Romans 9 is really saying. Now, when you read the whole context of it. And if you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. You're saved. You're saved. Peter's passage is clear. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. In other words, God knew. Before he even created this universe, God knew that Brian Tubbs in 1981 would call upon the name of the Lord. God knew that. And God made the decision to predestine me and save me before the foundations of the universe, and he knew I would call upon him. And Ephesians 2, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. So here's the deal. Nothing you can do can save yourself. You can't save yourself. Nothing you can do. In fact, nothing you can say on your own is going to save you. But God's grace is so awesome that he extends to you the gift of salvation. And if you profess your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And you say, well, I don't understand. How can you reconcile that with God's foreknowledge? Let me just say very bluntly to you, 
You don't need to understand this completely. You don't need to battle over this. You don't need to divide over this. One of the, one of my favorite pastors is John MacArthur. He's definitely in the Reformed camp, in the John Calvin camp. And yet, MacArthur himself acknowledges that there is a mystery to this. He talks about how, when you look in Romans 1, how God holds everyone accountable. Everyone in the human race, God holds them responsible for their choices. And MacArthur says, how can I reconcile that with God's foreknowledge and his predestination? And he said, I've, I've watched his sermon. He said, I don't know. I just know that's what God says. I'm going to believe it. And I would submit to you, that's really what it comes down to, if you trust God or not. I, I trust God more than I trust the fact that we're here by accident. And I trust the fact that God's in control. And I'm not going to stand up here and say, I, I have figured out the mystery of election. You know, Because there's aspects of this mystery that we will not figure out this side of eternity. But we don't have to. We just need to trust God. Uh, but one thing, I want, there's two things I wanted to get across in this message today. Is one, don't be insecure about your salvation. If you have sincerely called upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says you shall be saved. It's a promise from God Almighty. And so you don't need to worry about it. You are part of the elect at that point. And the second thing is your identity is not, as Sam Harris and the philosophers and atheists say, that your identity is simply wrapped up in chance and accident and a bunch of molecular molecules. Your identity is wrapped up in the fact that you were made in the image of God, in the image of God. Our choices do matter. They matter. God is sovereign and in control. Absolutely. He's sovereign and in control. But he delegates a degree of free will, a degree of free will to those who he made in his image. And that's us, human beings. He made us in his image. And so he delegates a degree of free will to us. Exactly what that degree is, is a mystery. We don't know. But he does do it. I like to think of it like if you're a parent, if you ever put your child in a playpen, you put your child in a playpen to contain your child and to keep your child safe. Your child has choices to make, but your child, theoretically, has to stay in that playpen. All right? Now, I say theoretically because we've all seen videos and all experienced the fact that sometimes children get out of what they're, you know, they, they sometimes get out of the crib or get out of the playpen or whatnot. But the idea is you're contained, okay? You're contained. And, uh, but in God's eyes, or in God's mind, we're never going to escape God's containment. You know, God delegates a degree of free will to us, but we're still within his control. We're still under his sovereignty. And therefore, we are under his protection. Uh, God knows all and never relinquishes his control. Our choices do matter. They matter because God tells us the choices matter. You know what I find ironic? Sam Harris writes his book, Free Will. And he writes his book, Free Will, to persuade people to understand that we don't have free will. Let that sink in, the irony of that. Um, uh, but here's the thing. If our choices didn't matter, why did God send Jesus? If our choices didn't matter, or wh why do we even have the Bible? Our choices matter to God. They matter to God. They matter because you matter to God. But know that God's choices matter most. God, God is in control. I love the story of Jonah and, 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 and all that. And this is a perfect example of this. God's ultimate will was that Jonah go to Nineveh and preach repentance to the people of Nineveh so that Nineveh would repent. That was God's ultimate will. That was not Jonah's will. Jonah rebelled against God. Jonah gets on a boat, goes the opposite direction. Okay? And doesn't want to go to Nineveh. Did Jonah end up going to Nineveh? <laughs> yes, he did. Okay. All right. So Jonah... God delegated a degree of free will to Jonah and that Jonah could have cooperated. He could have had a nice mode of transportation to Nineveh. Instead, instead, Jonah had God's alternate means of transportation. And, 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 and uh, well, you know the story. And then that, that all spits him up on the beach. And, uh, and then Jonah was motivated at that point to follow God's will. Uh, Jonah was delegated a degree of free will. And it says, many, in the, many, of the plans of the, are the, many are the plans of man in the heart, but God's purpose is established. As it says in Proverbs, God had his ultimate will. That ultimate will was, Nineveh needs to be preached to. Now, God could have raised up another prophet, or God could have done what he did and made sure Jonah the prophet goes, whether Jonah wanted to or not. I believe it is God's will, for example, that we reach the people here in Alton. That we reach the lost in Montgomery County. This is our mission field, ladies and gentlemen. I believe it's God's will to do that. I believe God is leading OBC into a new chapter where we are going to reach these people in a more dramatic way than we ever reached them before. I believe that. And I can stand up here and say confidently, I am convinced this is God's will for us to do that. I believe it. Based on the response of the surveys and the votes taken, a majority of you are with us in that. And I appreciate that. And frankly, even some of the critical 
our concerns were very godly, you know, in the surveys and stuff. So I'm not at all bashing anyone up here um, when I say that. Um, and we will respond and answer some of those questions in, in due time. But I believe God's going to lead us to do great things. But he does delegate to us a degree of free will. We can rebel against God if we want to. In which case, God will then force us to do it by raising up other people in the Holy Baptist Church to do as well. Or God will find another church to do as well. But I don't want to be on the sidelines as God does his will. I want to be one of the people that's on the field doing the will of God. And I hope that's your prayer as well. Now, uh, tomorrow is known unofficially and culturally as President's Day, but if you'll permit me to close with honoring the person that is meant to honor, and that's George Washington. Uh, tomorrow is George Washington's birthday observed. Washington is perfect to illustrate the idea of God's will. In the French Indian War, Washington was, was an aide to a British general named Braddock, and they were heading up to the Mon Mon Monongo. I don't know if I can pronounce that right, but it's up where modern-day Pittsburgh is. Uh, and uh, what was it? Mon that. Okay, so uh, and uh, so it's uh, so he's heading up there, and the French and Indians, the Native Americans, were, were warring against the British, and they, uh, they, they ambushed him. They attacked. And Braddock's army was decimated. Two-thirds of his army was killed. Uh, it was, it was a, the greatest defeat of the English army in the history of England up until that point. Uh, it was a humiliating defeat. Uh, all of the officers were shot off their horses or killed, uh, except George Washington. Washington was the only mounted officer to not get, not get shot. Uh, and, in fact, uh, he lost two horses. Two of his horses were shot off from under him, but he mounted his third horse. And he was, he was responsible for rallying the survivors of the attack and getting them to safety. He became a hero throughout the colonies as a result of his actions there. Later that evening, when he was removing his uniform, he noticed there were four, four bullet holes in his uniform. And he wrote his brother and said that Providence had protected him. Throughout the entire battle, all these bullets were whizzing around. All these other people were falling. All the officers were falling, including Braddock, who was mortally wounded and died later. Yet Washington didn't fall. Later, in the American Revolution, Washington, the same thing, dashing in and out of enemy fire. And continually. Normally you don't see the commander in chief doing that, but he did. He was constantly riding up, facing the British, sharpshooters shooting at him. One funny incident, he was trotting up, and there was a British sniper that had him right in his sights. And the, Brit the British sergeant wrote about this later. He said, I had this American general in my sights, but someone wouldn't let me pull the trigger. And so he just stared, they had to stare down, and finally watched him just kind of shrugged and just bounced away. And, uh, and so later the British sergeant found out that was George Washington. He could have killed the commander-in-chief right then, but something wouldn't let him do it. Years after the French and Indian War, a Native American tribe met Washington on, on, on the road. Washington was a surveyor, did all kinds of surveying around here. And one of the chiefs there said, you know, I remember you from that day, from that battle. We tried to kill you. We kept shooting at you, but we could not kill you. So finally, I ordered my braves to stop, to stop shooting at you because obviously you were protected by the Great Spirit. In the American Revolution, so many things were happening in the American Revolution that was inexplicable. The British would have the Americans dead to rights and would just stop. At one point, Washington had to bring his army across the river to escape from, from the next morning when they would have been finished off. This was a New York campaign. And yet, so Washington's trying to ferry his army across and get them across, but yet daylight's coming up and the British are going to see them. So a mysterious fog descends and protects that army. This historical fact, you can look it up. So Washington writes in 1778 to a friend of his, a fellow general, he says these words. He writes, The hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all this that he must be worse than an infidel. He steals a phrase from the Apostle Paul there. That lacks faith and more than wicked that has not gratitude enough to acknowledge his obligations. Did God use George Washington? I believe he did. Now, was George Washington perfect? No, he was not. He was a slave owner. He was a sinner. But I want to say to you, and I'm not making light of that sin, but thank God, God uses sinners. Because if God didn't use sinners, he wouldn't use any of us. And so, and Washington, to his credit, recognized that was a sin. Holy Spirit worked with him over the years, and at the end of his life, in his will, he freed his slaves. Now, when he did that, Richard Allen the uh, African-American pastor of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He's the founder of the AME Church. Allen eulogized Washington 
and said that by freeing his slaves, Washington would remove the one stain on his character. Then what? But then Allen, as most of the country did, eulogized Washington as a great man. The fact is, God uses flawed people. Flawed people like George Washington and flawed people like you and me. And so, guess what? Do you want to be used of God? Or do you not want to be used of God? That is the choice that you get to make. To be used or not used by God. You get to make that choice. But God's purposes ultimately will stand. And that is why we can take comfort in his protection. As it says in Psalm 91, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I will trust. Thankfully, I don't serve a weak God. I serve a sovereign God who is in control. And therefore, this promise means something to me. His sovereignty secures my protection. And uh, as the praise team comes forward to close out our service today, thank God that, that we also, his sovereignty secures my identity. I am not just here by accident. I am not here because, oops, you know, Edward and Carolyn Tubbs, my parents, they did try the rhythm method, and uh, it worked. I'm here, and not exactly the time they wanted me here, but uh, I'm here. All right? I was an accident to them, but I was not an accident to God. And the same thing is true for you. No matter the circumstances of your birth, no matter what's going on in your, in your brain, no matter what's happening neurologically inside of you, your molecules and all of that, you are not an accident. Your identity is shaped in the fact that you were created intentionally by the creator God of this universe. Your identity is wrapped up in him. And here, uh, Daniel and Kristen are going to sing a song that's on uh, the radio right now uh, as we close out the service today. And that is, I am who you say I am. You see, we are who we are. God said so. As this person says here, the question of who I am is bigger than who I am. Therefore, I think it's far wiser to ask the great I am who I am. That's our identity. Let's pray. Thank you so much for bringing us together today. Thank you so much for the power of your word. I pray now that you will help us to rest in your sovereignty and rest in your power. Help us to know that you are in control and that we are who you say we are. It's in Jesus' name we pray this prayer. Amen.